Hey, it's Benji Cole, son of Al Cole from CBS Radio and host of People of Distinction. The talk that gives an in-depth view of some of the most dynamic, intelligent, and successful people on the planet. Run to our website, peopleofdistinction.org, for more info. Or you can always email me directly at benji at alcoholenterprises.com. And on the line with us today, we have Kurt Simlaska. We'll be discussing his fantastic book, Terminal Cascade, available for purchase through Amazon as well as barnesandnoble.com. But guys, make sure that when you're looking into purchasing the book, the audiobook is available as well as the ebook format. So it's available in all publishing formats. Make sure you're picking up copies for whatever one works best for you. And I will say that Kurt was brought to our network, People of Distinction, today by some of the best movers in the business. Far Eastern Marketing Publishing. So if you have a book that you'd like moved, make sure you're doing yourself a favor and you're contacting our great friends over at Far Eastern. You can find out more information on them at fareasternmarketing.com. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Kurt, first and foremost, welcome to People of Distinction and thank you so much for being a guest. How are you? I'm great, Benji. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Kurt, listen, it's an honor, man. And we're really looking forward to this. And I know we have so much information to cover. But before we go into the book, let's hold off slightly. Kurt, start by telling our listening audience a little bit more about yourself and your background, please. Well, I'm from a small town, southern Minnesota. I came from a large Catholic family, put myself through college and then medical school at the University of Minnesota. And then I signed my life away to the military so that they would pay for some of my education and uh, ended up doing my residency training in, in uh, internal medicine at Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu. And then after I did my residency training, I was asked to stay on as uh, chief resident. And then from there, I went to Walter Reed to do my dermatology training and then went back to Tripler for another five years as chief of service in dermatology and internal medicine and got to take care of some fantastic uh, patients and, and saw a lot of disease. I, I, I love disease. The more bizarre it is, the better. And I think that feeds into my creative side too. While I was uh, back from um, as chief of service there, the University of Hawaii uh, asked us if we uh, could use some satellite time. They had some free satellite time. And because of that, we were able to set up telemedicine into the Pacific. Many of you don't realize this, but in the Pacific Islands, we have some very intelligent people sitting out there in monitoring stations, tracking the shuttle and, you know, ballistic missiles and all that kind of stuff. So when these people get sick out there, we had to fly them into Tripler to be able to take care of them. So this was a golden opportunity for us to set up a, a telemedicine clinic, and we're able to keep a lot of these people on the islands. And that actually comes into play later in my life when I get deployed to set up telemedicine in Bosnia. And um, so after I was at Tripler for another five years, I went back to Walter Reed to teach dermatology there. And I was sitting in my office one day when the DCCS of the hospital comes down and says, hey, heard you're an expert in telemedicine. Um, we need you to help set this stuff up in Bosnia. Here's your orders. Two days later, I was on a plane to Lonstuhl, Germany. Uh, wow. to set this up. And I was attached to this organization called the Combat Casualty Research Center. And these guys were amazing. Um, I've never seen a more dedicated group of physicians in my life. These are mostly ER docs that are dedicated to set up um, uh, medical support for all branches of the uh, military service, particularly special operations branch, the FBI, the DEA, the Secret Service. So a lot of the stuff that I write about and incorporate in my book is actually true. Um, at that time, the director of the CCRC was actually also uh, doing work with uh, the Russian medical school, and they were analyzing um, databases on uh, mine injuries. And so he was in a situation where he was in Moscow and he's also in the United States Army. How cool was that? And so that was one of the things that started setting me up for writing this plot of developing this plot where he's the only one who's in a situation to be able to put the pieces together uh, for what goes on. Mm -hmm. um, I started to write um, and when screenplays and stuff back then, and I, my first book was You Carry On. And uh, it took me till 1998 to get that published. Getting books published is really tough, particularly back then. And uh, so I was very serious about this writing stuff, and I was writing screenplays and books. And so I actually got out of the military in 96 
um, got Eukaryon published in 98 and then launched into writing Terminal Cascade um, uh, based on, on this plot that I had developed. And I was going to writers' conferences. I was going to pitch sessions. I was, you know, here in, in I moved to Las Vegas and I went into private practice in dermatology. But on the side, I was doing all this other stuff with, uh, you know, trying to write. I was going to writers' retreats and the whole thing, uh, very dedicated to trying to get this stuff going. And then something happened. It's what I call BM and BC, before marriage and before children. And so all of a sudden, you know, after I got married and had kids, all this stuff went to the back seat. And many of my patients read You Carry On. They said, where's your next book? And I said, well, here is the manuscript. It's a 500-page manuscript. So I'd give them the manuscript, and they'd bring it back, and they'd say, you've got to get this published. So um, I finally did. Because of what's going on, it was kind of like a lot of stuff that I wrote about in the book is happening now. And so I decided to get it published, and I, I went through page publishing and got it published. Fantastic. You know, Kurt, what an impressive resume. Listen, we're, we're going to have to have you back on the network, okay? Not to discuss this book or any other books that you write in the future, but just to discuss your resume, man, and, and your background, because I'm sure you have stories for days, and we would love to hear them. <laughs> but in terms yeah, I'd of. I'd love to tell them. There you go. <laughs> In terms of today's interview, though, Kurt, the anchor that brought you here is Terminal Cascade. So without further ado, tell us a little bit more about your book. Well, it basically is a revenge story, and it's and along the way I throw in a lot of historical fiction. I literally um, take you through the fall of the USSR in the 80s and the 90s. Um, I take you through what it's like to live under a communist rule. I also take you through the CIA during that period, during the Cold War period, double agents, toxicology, betrayal, murder, it's all in there. And most of it's based on factual information. I research my books extensively and try to keep them as real as possible. There are multiple protagonists and antagonists, but the main uh, character in the book um, is Yuri, and he's a Russian scientist uh, attached to the S-100 laboratory, which is a real laboratory in Russia of the day. Uh, and their sole purpose was to design poisons and toxins that would be used by the KGB or the GRU to take people out. I mean, that's what their mission was. And so uh, this S-100 laboratory is where Yuri is working on this toxin. And um, he has this dilemma of trying to develop a toxin and uh, for, for, for use by his government, by this communist government. And his principal job was to try to develop immunity to it, because if he could immunize the troops, then he would have, you know, a weapon of mass destruction that could take out cities and not have any destruction of any of the existing uh, structures. Um, mm -hmm. So... Um, I take you through the evolution of this main character and uh, how he uh, develops this immunity to it and is willing to use it as a weapon of mass destruction to instigate his his revenge. So he has to figure out how to do the talk, how to develop this immunity, and in doing so, it goes through great personal sacrifice to do it. That just shows you how motivated this guy is, and I can't tell you how he does it. Um, but you will find out when you read it. The book is very unusual in that it is um, set up, every other chapter is past and present. So the whole book is in the past, then the present. Then the next chapter is in the past, then the present. And I did that um, because I wanted to show you what he went through um, and what actually caused him to develop the way he did and become the ultimate monster that he becomes and being able to take out people at will from a guy who was really quite mild mannered. And another reason why I did this is because at the end of the past chapters is there's a great reveal. And that reveal is how does he deploy the toxin? So while you're reading this book, I want the reader to ask themselves, how is he deploying it? And it is not revealed until the end of the book. So it's a big mystery. Yuri is um, also, it's a very unique book in that the, Yuri is a uh, protagonist in the past and he's an antagonist in the future. So, you know, very few books actually have a character who's actually in both positions, but he is. 
in the present, um, our main uh, protagonist is Eric, and Eric is the director of the CCRC. Uh, and as I mentioned, many of the things that he is doing is actually stuff that I've experienced. And so it's really based on a lot of really truth um, in that he did provide medical support to the Russian medical schools in the 90s. And he's in a position to in the plot to be able to put all the pieces together, realizing that this thing, this toxin came out of Moscow. And he's in a position to go there and work his contacts to try to figure out how to deal with it and how to protect against it. Fantastic. Um, the toxin itself is interesting because uh, I have published extensively in hypercoagulable conditions. These are clotting disorders. I've published big reviews on primary and secondary hypercoagulable states and, and how they come into play. And, and so I was able to take that and just adapt it to this toxin. I did some research on C60 and C70 carbon buckyballs and was able to incorporate that into developing this toxin, throwing a helium core into it so that the molecule would actually be neutral buoyancy and would sit in the atmosphere without rising too fast or falling too much so that the toxin is uh, a very, very lethal and very, very uh, dispens you know, uh, permeates the air very, very quickly. There you have it. You know, Kurt, next question. I'm really curious. What would you say was the most difficult part in writing this book? You know, it really, there really wasn't any. It was just pretty much all in my head. I had years to think about it. You know, I was concentrated on getting Eucarion published, and so I was writing this book in my head for um, for a long time. So when I sat down and started writing, I just started chapter one all the way through to chapter 50, and I was done. Of course, you go back and do editing and spiff this up and clean this up. But um, for the most part, I just sat down and wrote it. And this kind of probably comes out of I think being a physician, I remember when uh, uh, we got into, when I got accepted into medical school, the University of Minnesota makes you take something called the MMPI, which is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory Test. And they use this for uh, psych patients to try and see if they can define personality traits that may contribute to certain disorders. And so on my first day in medical school, the director of the University of Minnesota's medical program got up there and says, I have the results of the MMPI for all you guys. And as a group, you are collectively slightly schizophrenic, you're compulsive obsessive as hell, and you have a great fear of death. I thought I, that always stuck with me. I thought that was pretty, pretty amazing because, you know, I guess you really do want docs that are very compulsive. And I think that comes into play with my writing. Again, here on the line with Kurt Semlaska. We're discussing his fantastic book, Terminal Cascade, available for purchase through Amazon as well as BarnesandNoble.com. But remember, the audio book as well as the ebook are also available. You know, next question, Kurt, that I'd love to go into. It, what do you think is the impact to your audience when they read your book? There are a lot of themes to the book, and that's one of the reasons why I felt so compelled to get it published. I think nowadays, uh, particularly with the younger uh, younger people today, they just they think that communism is just something that's hey, that's not been done right in the past, and I think it's something mm -hmm. that we could use. But um, so one of the things I wanted to show is I wanted to really plug you into what communism was like in the USSR in the 80s and the 90s, what eventually led to the complete collapse of uh, the, their system. And I contrast that with capitalism. Um, another theme is how do you fight fanaticism? And I take you through what the U.S. government agencies were doing to combat it back in the 90s. Remember back then, there was Waco, there was Ruby Ridge, there was the Oklahoma City bombing. And back in the 90s, when I was kind of beginning to write this, it was a real concern of, uh, you know, these uh, neo-Nazi groups and white, uh, white supremacist groups kind of gaining and I think the Oklahoma City bombing incident really just killed that whole movement. I think it was so horrific uh, with those children being killed and all those innocent people being killed. I think mm -hmm. it really killed that whole thing. But I take you through what the uh, federal agencies were thinking about and how they were approached trying to, trying to stop it. Um, the CCRC was there. They were there at Ruby Ridge. Um, I remember one day the director, uh, when I was with those guys, said, hey, Kurt, grab a surgical kit. We're going to Quantico. And we drove down to Quantico, and he was doing immunizations for the HRT team. And one of the HRT guys had a large, fairly large lipoma in his arm. And so he said, take it out. So we laid this guy out on a table. The rest of the teammates were around. I surgically excised this uh, lipoma, closed it up, and, you know, 
this stuff is real. These guys are really intense and they're dedicated. So I just wanted to kind of impart that too within the book. This is real stuff. Corruption. Corruption is part of everything. It's part of our system. It's part of communist systems. And how do you deal with it? It's not always fair and how it manifests. Mm -hmm. But so I, you know, I want people to think about that and how the various systems deal with it. Um, the other thing I think that becomes very evident at the end of the book is that the United States is a representative republic. We choose who who leads us, essentially. We choose the people that uh, tell us what to do. And because of this, we are responsible for what our governments do, good or bad. So what happens when we are called to task for what our government does? And are we held responsible? And each and every one of us really does have a responsibility to do the best we can to choose the best people. Kurt, multi-part question here. First and foremost, what is the intended message for your book, the underlying theme? And then how do you want your readers to interpret that message? Okay, um, I'm going to actually leave it up to the readers. I take you through this amazing story of love, hate, vengeance, betrayal, and hope. And I will leave it up to the readers to reflect on all of it. I think the reader will be most conflicted over Yuri for what he goes through, the forces that come into play to cause him to develop such an intense hatred of those who he holds responsible for the death of his wife. All the way to the end, you will see him evolve, morph into somebody that he really isn't. And because of what he does and what he goes through, step by step, revelation by revelation, it's a very gripping story. And I think the reader will be incredibly moved by this character, and I believe that they will have empathy for him despite what he does. You know, and then as we close out of this fantastic interview, Kurt, you know, I love having this platform. You know, being an artist myself, and I'm in a different medium. My audience knows this. I'm an, an actor and a filmmaker based out in Los Angeles. But having this platform, I love being able to, to pay it forward, in a sense, to other artists out there listening in. In this instance, other writers out there listening in. And I'd love to take this opportunity, Kurt, to pick your brain and really steal some words of wisdom for, from you. What advice would you be able to offer to any aspiring authors listening in? Well, I think it's terribly cliche, but everybody says write about what you know and what you are passionate about. But I think that's a good base. Mm -hmm. I think uh, people write because they're passionate about writing. They want to write. They have to write. You know, there's a lot of that that comes into play. But I would also say don't be afraid to take on things that you don't know anything about, things that uh, that you can research and you can apply that research to learn and to develop uh, core core improvements to your plot. I think in my situation, that occurred with my very first chapter when I have the characters, the S-100 team is actually trudging through the Amazon basin looking for what they think might be a toxin based on uh, the Keope Indian folklore of a black forest that doesn't allow anything to survive or live in it. And in developing this, toxin that they discover, knowing that nothing can survive it, how do you discover it? And I needed to have uh, a animal that could survive it. And so in researching this, I remember sitting over at the University of Nevada library uh, at, uh, on the university campus, looking through all these books, trying to find out about some extinct animals that I could use. And I came across uh, Myodona robustus, actual pictures of the Keopo Indians with, this, uh, with the shells of these giant armadillos that actually existed in the Amazon basin. And they would use these shells um, as huts, as small huts. They were probably the original RV people hauling these huts around with them, you know, were giant shells. And so that was really fun. But it was something that I discovered and was able to apply. And knowing that this organism or this, or not, this uh, animal could survive the toxin meant that you could develop immunity. And that's how the S100 team realized that they could possibly develop immunity against this toxin. There you have it. You know, going back to one of the first things that you said, Kurt, guys, write what you know, write what you're passionate about. You know, I love that advice. And, you know, you, you mentioned, Kurt, that it, it's a cliche. Right. But here's the thing. There's a reason why cliches become cliches, because they're 
because there's truth to them, right? I mean, it's steeped in something that we can actually pinpoint and we can put our finger on. And guys, that is great advice for anything in life, not even if you're a writer. Of course, if you're a writer, make sure you're writing, right? Write what you're passionate about, write what you know. But anything that you're doing in life, that can apply, right? Do things that you are passionate about, Operate on tasks that you care about because when you have that care, that compassion to bring towards the task, A, you don't feel like you're working. B, you have so much more it's, – it's much more delicate, right? It's almost like your child that you're birthing. So you approach it in a much, much, much more serious way. I absolutely love that advice, guys. That's great for you to take and apply And then from there, you can branch off. You can start doing other things. But definitely, when your heart is in the right place, you know, it's going to take you in the right direction. I absolutely love it. Guys, you know what I love even more? Is we're at the end of the interview now. We've discussed so much information, but yet we've barely scratched the surface. (laughs) There is still so much left to be discovered. And that's why I'm going to say it one more time, even though I know I don't have to. Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com are the places you have to go. Terminal Cascade is the title you have to pick up. And Kurt Samlaska is the author you have to thank for bringing it to your table. Get lost in the journey. Utilize this fantastic narrative to branch safely outside of the confinement that you found yourself stuck in. I know that I will. Kurt, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you once again for being a guest with us today on People of Distinction. Thank you, Benji. I really appreciate your time.